Few mathematicians will ever admit to this, but over the course of their careers, they have written many useless papers. That was a phrase which Abel Prize winner Michel Talagrand said about himself and his own research. And yet, he added that it's not a wasted effort. These useless and insignificant papers turned out to be crucial for understanding probability in a way no one has before, something beyond normal human interpretation. His mind works in a way that our minds don't. He won several distinguished awards like the Loew Prize, Firma Prize, the Shaw Prize, and in 2024, the Abel Prize. Well, the man must have been born a genius. Yeah, not really. So, I suppose something happened in his past that made his mind operate differently. Before telling me his advancement of probability, which we will get to, what was it that happened in his life? Well, it's really interesting. And he wrote it in his short autobiography. He comes from a line of peasants, with grandparents who were either illiterate or could barely read. After one of his grandfathers became a real-world worker, he could provide education to his kids, which is when Michel's father, Pierre, became something equivalent to a college math professor. But Michel himself was no genius. He was placed in classes reserved for some of the worst, and dare I say, stupidest students. Mostly because he was awful at spelling and grammar. So when was it that he finally got into mathematics? Sounds just like any other kid, to be honest. Well, okay, he was born with really weak retinas. At five years old, his right eye became blind, and at 15, he was close to losing his left eye as well. To try and save his left eye, he spent several months bandaged up at the hospital, which is when his father taught him math to keep his brain working. After getting back to school, he became an excellent math and physics student. By his last year of high school, he was ranked third nationally in math and physics. That's crazy! I guess being blind for six months really taught him how to think differently. It is really interesting. And Talagrand calls that his mysterious turning point. So tell me, what did he win the Abel Prize for? What was so groundbreaking about his contribution? The prize recognized his contributions to probability theory, specifically in the areas of Gaussian processes and spin glasses. The Gaussian distribution, surprisingly, is one of the most common patterns in pretty much any random thing, be it at what age athletes retire, mass of babies at birth, or test results at schools. Imagine the Gaussian distribution as a symmetrical bell-shaped curve, where most of the data cluster around a central point, known as the mean or average. The frequency of the data decreases as it moves away from the center in both directions. Suppose you measure the heights of all the adult women in a small town. You might find that most women have a height close to the average of, say, 165 centimeters. But there are fewer women who are much shorter or much taller than this. If you plotted all these heights on a graph, you would likely see a bell-shaped curve with the peak at 165 centimeters. Most of the data points, which are heights in this case, would be near this average, and the number of people would decrease as the heights deviate more from the average. Talagrand developed frameworks to study these bell curves in order to make better and much more accurate predictions. Yes, but I assume single Gaussian distribution is a simple case scenario. So, dealing with just a one-dimensional object, like a line, where most values cluster around the mean is simple. But what happens when you introduce more variables? Well, if each distribution is considered an additional axis, the resulting shape is a multidimensional object. In higher dimensions, it's beyond human comprehension. But that's exactly what Talagran successfully did, understand these higher dimensional spaces. And all of this using measure theory. Not visually, of course, but mathematically. This approach is similar to how you might estimate the area under a curve in calculus, using Riemann sums or the way pixel density can represent an image. First, let's see how it works for lower dimensions. In measure theory, the measure can be thought of as a way to assign a size to a set. Imagine a distribution like a Gaussian bell curve plotted on a graph. The area under the curve represents the total probability. To calculate this area, one approach is to divide the entire area under the curve into very small squares or rectangles. Each square represents a tiny segment of the total distribution. Each square has a straightforward area calculation, length times width. 
Since the squares are very small, they approximate the curve's shape more closely. By summing up the areas of all these tiny squares, you get an approximate total area under the curve. The smaller and more numerous the squares, the more accurate your approximation. In higher dimensions, it obviously becomes more complex. In two dimensions, you split the area under a curve into squares to approximate its measure. In three dimensions, you would split the volume under a surface into small cubes. In higher dimensions, the concept remains the same, but you use hypercubes or other multidimensional shapes to partition the space. Just like adding up the areas of squares in 2D, you would sum the volumes of these hypercubes in higher dimensions. Each hypercube's volume is calculated by multiplying the lengths of its sides, assuming a hypercube in n dimensions with each side of length epsilon, its volume is epsilon to the power of n. Okay, so essentially you're telling me that Telegrand was able to develop mathematical techniques to measure higher dimensional shapes in Gaussian probability, and as a result, make more accurate predictions because more variables are considered. This is groundbreaking because it's extremely unintuitive. Did I sum that up correctly? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I'll give you an example of how geometric configurations can change drastically when we go to higher dimensions. Imagine a circular disk, a 2D circle, trapped within a square bounded by four unit circles, each with radius one. The largest possible radius that the central circle can have is about 0.41421. This is derived geometrically, considering how the circle fits among the four unit circles and the boundaries of the square. If you guys are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. This example shows how the arrangement of circles affects the maximum size of the circle in the center. The scenario extends to three dimensions, where you have spheres instead of circles, inside of a box. The sphere that sits in the middle would have a radius of 0.73205, slightly bigger than previously. Our intuition is that there may be a little more wiggle room with the extra dimensions, so dimensions beyond the three. With the extra dimensions, the central sphere will remain bounded. But that's actually completely false. In four dimensions, with 16 unit spheres, the central sphere will be the same size as them. By 10D, the central unit is so large, it reaches outside of the box. And by 26D, it is twice the size of the box. And that's what it means to go against our intuition. It doesn't match what we expect. Telegrand contributed to our understanding of probability distributions in higher dimensional and more complex spaces. There are many applications of Telegrand's work, including the problem of spin glass. It's not like actual glass from a window, but a random structure of magnetic moments. This video was based on a glimpse of the laureate's work by Matt Parker, as well as Telegrand's autobiography. Well, if you're interested in knowing more about spin glasses, leave a comment below. And check out this video right here. I'm pretty sure you're gonna love it. See you there.